Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham. Hey, Jim. Hi, John. How are you? I'm good. It's the, this is going to be, I think, a pretty interesting episode. I agree with you completely. Uh, the, the opportunity to get to talk to somebody uh, of Kreskin's n- not only ability, but also just the incredible depth and breadth of the man's career uh, was, I just can't wait. Yeah, that, a very interesting fellow. Uh, and the reason we have Kreskin here is uh, you're going to be reading chapter two of The Ambitious Card. And in that chapter, we meet our antagonist, a mentalist named Gray, who's performing in the Wabasha Street Caves. Eli is there to watch and then to sort of be the uh, the voice of the opposition after Gray finishes his act. But chapter two and a good part of chapter three are all of Gray doing his mentalism act. And I thought, if we're going to talk about mentalism, you know, mm-hmm. there's there's probably two names that would come to mind. Sure. Nowadays, you think Darren Brown. Who, genius. Beyond genius. Yep. Scary, uh, entertaining, uh, funny, thought-provoking. Yeah. But Darren would be the big name. And then the amazing Kreskin. Just the opportunity to chat with the man is fantastic, I think. Yeah, it was a pretty interesting interview. Uh, he talked about how he got started, uh, the value of failing, the birth of the uh, of the mighty Karnak. Which, was Which is, just, you know, how funny is that? Well, you'll hear it when you when we talk to him, but he was on Carson like 5,000 times. Yeah. And Letterman. And he still, he was on Fallon. Yeah. So, I mean, they, at 86, he's still exactly. going strong. He, he started on TV there doing this kind of thing with Steve Allen. Yeah. Which tells you, and now he's on Fallon. That's quite a career. That, that is quite spans, a career. That spans the entire late night from beginning to almost, uh, you know, yeah, something that's... else. So uh, enough of us chatting about him. Uh, yeah. Let's let's go uh, talk to the amazing Kreskin. So let's go back to the very beginning. How did you actually create your mentalism act? Well, that's an interesting uh, question. I, uh, you know, I, I had no teachers. You know, I had no, I had no models because uh, I've seen very few performers in my life. I just don't get to see performers. I started as a magician uh, years ago, and then, you know, which I've done all over the world. The airline industry announced uh, two years ago that I've now flown a little, little over three and a half million miles, wow. which I'm told is more than many pilots have, commercial pilots, and uh, a lot of performers have as well. So uh, I have nothing against magic. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's a great art form and what have you. And I uh, admired magicians. I didn't, I didn't know many of them. I was just interviewed by a very famous one not long ago, but my uh, my model character was a uh, a comic book because when I was five six years old, I of course I couldn't read, so my mother would read to me comics, and I have about two hundred of the of original comics which I prize, and one of the comics was one of the biggest in the Second World War, and that was Mandrake the Magician. He was the magician. He had hypnotic abilities and telepathic abilities and solve crimes and what have you. And that became my uh, model. So when when we would go out to play, when we played Cops and Robbers, I played Mandrake. And then uh, in my uh, uh, third grade, Miss Curtis was raining outside and she said to all of us, well, you're not gonna go out and play. I'm gonna teach you a game. And she sent uh, one of my classmates, I remember Jane Hamilton, I saw her a few, about a year ago, sent her out into the hallway and said, Jane, wait there. And we hit a bean bag. We hit somewhere in someone's desk. We called uh, Jane back in and, and uh, Ms. Curtis said, Jane, you walk around. When you're getting near it, we'll say you're getting warm. When you're not near it, you're cold. Old game of cotton cold. And she found it. I was so upset that I didn't get to play it. When I got home, I got a hold of my brother and we walked over to my grandparents' house to a, at the Roseland Avenue. And I said, here, take this penny and hide it upstairs. So anyway, he goes upstairs and then he calls me. And I'll never forget, you know, I'm only nine years old. I'm walking upstairs. My grandmother doesn't know what's going on because she didn't speak much English. We loved her dearly. And I find myself wandering into Michael's bedroom. And I climbed up on a uh, 
chair because I was short. I'll never forget this, a brown chair. And I found myself reaching behind a curtain rod and there was a penny. And when I came down, climbed down, and I went in the kitchen where my brother was, I suddenly realized I forgot to tell my brother to tell me whether I'm getting hot or cold. I forgot to tell him anything. He didn't know what the heck was going on. Grandma, because she's Italian, probably thought I had the evil eye, which was healthy because in those days it, that became legendary. <laughs> but uh, that was the beginning of my career. And in grade school, I would do experiments and uh, fourth and sixth grade performances during show and tell. And then, as I told you, by the time I was in high school, I was doing uh, full, full shows. So my career, I didn't have a, a public model or someone I had seen. I, I rarely saw magicians. I mean, years later, I saw them on TV and what have you. And I liked great sleight of hand artists, great illusionists. But at the same time, that was the beginning of a career that uh, has evolved through the years. And uh, still, I'm still working uh, busily. I celebrated uh, uh, a few weeks ago my 86th birthday, but I still run 20 minutes every night. I went through a lot of uh, the videos of your performances online, and one thing kept reoccurring as I watched them, which is that not only is your audience having fun, but you seem to be having a great time. You said something very special. I, I appreciate your saying that. That was my my work. You know, John, my work is is an experience. It's an adventure. I've traveled all over the world. I've even performed and bought. And, and Carson used to find it fascinating when I came back from Japan. He says, well, he says, your audience is, they speak English. I says, no, a lot of them did not, but there was ways, there was ways of working with an interpreter and what have you. But so my life, and then five and a half years off and on in Saudi Arabia, now that's an experience. I mean, and then, and then I had a series in Canada yeah. called The Amazing World of Crescent, which, um, was on for five and a half years. The first year was the second highest rated program in the nation. I'm very proud of that. The Canadian people think that I uh, am Canadian because I'm so much a part of, they've seen me so many years through the things now. If they knew me well enough, they wouldn't want to think that I was Canadian. No, I'm only joking. But at the same time, um, my life has been really like an adventure. And occasionally I'll meet a magician here and there, but I, I, I love to, because of my degree in psychology, a re, you know, experience of normal behavior. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> so you you mentioned your performances and you've done, you know, I don't know if you've added them up. It's got to be thousands and thousands and thousands of performances in front of all kinds of audiences. Have you ever thought about what are the key elements that you want to make sure make for a great show for you? That's interesting. That's a very interesting question because I think, uh, first of all, the, the problem in my not being able to teach someone what I do is that I could do it if I started when they were five or six or seven years old, because my career has been an evolution of factors involved that came into the picture and what have you. And then the beauty, the excitement of my work is that uh, there's, no, there's no footlights between myself and my audience. Yes, there are the lights on the floor there, but footlights meaning barriers because the, without the audience, I have no show. But my audience, when I walk out on stage, I think of them as one, uh, as a whole, because they become a unit of mood, experience, and what have you. And I, and, uh, I, I, when I laugh, I kid them about political, I don't, I don't mock politicians because I don't want to get involved in anything like that, but I kid them about what's going on. I give them a spark and what have you. And consequently, it personalizes what I do. So people are not coming to watch something. They really, when they come to my shows, I warn them, for God's sakes, don't come to watch me. Come to be part of the program. Because whether the audience is 30 people or a theater or four balconies like Carnegie Hall or a, a state fair like 10,000 or, or 20,000 people, I can make them part of the program. And that's part of the secret of my success. I can't say how I do it because right now it's it's become kind of a natural thing. Uh, can, it, can I ask a question just sure. about, uh, I know that you never have ever claimed to have any kind of supernatural powers, but that you instead are highly trained. Uh, do you, How do you respond to audience members who see your incredible performance come up to you and say, no, 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 no. You absolutely have some sort of, supernatural power you're just not admitting it to us 
I never, uh, I never claim uh, to be a psychic. And that's part of my persona. Uh, my also, I, uh, very, I, I learned something from the American Indian whom I've always had great respect for. And that is uh, something we learned as kids in grade school. It's an old saying of the American Indian. <clears throat> you never judge someone until you walk in their shoes. We don't do that today. We judge them ahead of time. We decide if they say they support someone that we either like them or dislike them. I think, God forbid, what a curse. How could you live in that particular way? But if you walk with people, and I uh, made it a normal thing, my, but when, I, when I met someone, when I was eight, 10, 12, 14 years old, I tried to walk the way did, they did, the same rhythm. And you know what's interesting after you do that? You start to think of the way they do. There's an instrument that's helping to destroy our culture. It's a very wonderful instrument. It's called a cell phone. But because of this, we don't hear each other anymore. We don't even listen to what each other's saying because we can get an answer real quick by just asking the phone and putting it down. Years ago, if you met with someone on a date or a business thing or some other thing, when you finish with them and you left them and you're by yourself, you start to reflect upon what they say. So I've trained hundreds and hundreds of business people how to reflect and learn from an experience they had by sound, by movement and what have you. And that's part of the secret of my lifestyle. But again, if we can't laugh, we got to be able to laugh at ourselves because that's part of the spark of life, you know, Phil's. We talked about laughter and how much fun you have with your audience, how much fun the audience has. I have to tell you, I, in, in prepping for this, I, I went online, looked at a lot of videos of you, and there was a, one or two appearances with David Letterman where oh. things didn't quite go right. That's right. And I've never seen a performer in you, particularly, who enjoyed the fact that something didn't go right as much as you did then, which is quite different than what you would call a standard mentalist. I got Once everything go right all the time, you are, you're so uh, open to whatever's going to happen. It's ironic you bring this up because a gentleman doing research on me uh, two, two days ago mentioned uh, David Letterman. You have to understand something that's, that's not happening as much in broadcasting anymore. Broadcasting is becoming, the nighttime shows are becoming too programmed. But you have to understand that, uh, that that's the key when there's humor and spontaneity, it is run with the thing. Take advantage of the spontaneity because that makes it more of an adventure. The uh, Everybody, uh, I, I'll tell the story now because it was one of the turning points of my life. People didn't know me that well in, in the States because I was doing a, maybe a lot of local shows in New York and some TV, but not that well known. So Steve Allen flies me out there to LA and it's nighttime. And he's standing at the other end of a stage because it was done in a theater setting, not a TV set. It's more of a theater setting. And he's standing on the dais, the way Letterman did everybody else did. And he says, you know, this young man is, is very gifted. He said, you probably don't know about him. So I walk out and in those days, 60s and 70s, the lights were very blinding and broadcasting. And the moving camera, as I'm walking, I had lights all around the top and the sides and they were blinding. And like I know it all, sure, I'm looking at the camera and I'm talking to Steve Allen who I never met before and saying how much I admire and so so As I'm getting closer <laughs> to Steve Allen, I'm also experiencing a phenomenon called blindness where I can't see. I go to turn to Steve Allen, trip over the dais and fall flat on my face. My family considers it the highlight of my career. So there I'm on the floor, you know, I'm kneeling down and the audience chuckles, but Steve Allen wasn't the mocking, mocking type comedian. He said, you're all right, young man, it's all right. And he was very kind to me, but a man was watching the show that night and he saw the incident going across the stage falling. And six or seven or eight weeks later, Johnny Carson created Karnak, the Magnificent. Oh. Karnak falling over the table was me. So it's great. I had I had no idea. That's so cool that well, let me the mighty Karnak was based let, on you. Let me tell you one more thing. I I never intended the title uh, amazing. I'd be walking on airplanes and people would be coming off and say, Hi, amazing, or I'd be coming off a plane in any part of the country or someone, and they'd say, Hi, amazing. I thought I would say to my road manager. That's really, 
very flattering to them. It's nice that they, that's the way they think of my work and what have you. And then, because <laughs> I didn't get to always see the night, nighttime shows early because I'd be working at night, I turn on the Carson show and I'm going to be on next week or let's say it's Friday and he's going to talk about Monday. And Johnny turns to Ed McMahon, who worked with Johnny for years, and, and, and Carson says, you know, Ed, we're having on uh, uh, Monday Kreskin. And, and, and Ed McMahon says, oh, that's great. And Carson said, well, you know, the last time he was on, it was only 90% amazing. And Ed McMahon said, no, it was 92% amazing. It turns out for all those years, they had that routine. That was a routine, so that's how I got the name. I didn't even know about it. And then, and then one of the crews says, "Don't you watching the?" And I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but no, I don't always see the shows. So that's how I came about. Do I could go on. I could go on for hours and tell you experiences from my career. One of the experiences I'd love for you to recount was the time you appeared at the Johnny Carson show, and the uh, routine you were planning on doing was, I think, uh, NBC executives said they were posed to what you're doing, right? NBC banned me from doing it and called me and said, you're not to do it with him. And I and Carson called me and told NBC off and said, you're going to do it. Carson had technical language, which some of you may have heard about it. A lot of it deals with four letter words and said, we well, thought of NBC and said, we're going to do it. And during the show, Bette Midler is a guest. I bring Johnny over the, on the set and Ed McMahon and and, and none of the crew knew I was going to do because we didn't do a walkthrough. So Johnny stands there and the man's there. And I said, I'm going to count Johnny. His eyes close. I said, Ed, if Johnny starts to swing backwards, you catch him. He says, you're goddamn right. I'll catch him. He, he didn't know what told him. Carson's going to fall over, you know. So Johnny sways and they catch him and they lift him. And I said, between two chairs, put his head and shoulders here, his feet there, nothing under the middle of him. There was no trickery involved. And we asked Beth Midler to come over and she wouldn't. And I asked her again a very nice way and she wouldn't. And Fred de Cordova, the producer said, why don't you, you gotta go over, you gotta go over. And she finally came over. And I said, I want you to sit in the middle of him. And she looked like I was out of my mind. I said, please sit in the middle of him and lift your legs up. No support under him, no, no support in the middle. And she lifted her leg and the audience was gasping. And they had a photographer, they didn't usually allow one, but they allowed one because I requested the picture of that scene was in the centerfold of Parade Magazine throughout the country a few days later. When we finished and lifted her off and slowly stood course and I counted backwards and his eyes opened, he said, I would have thought a baby was sitting on me. I used the power of suggestion to heighten his muscular reaction. And this is the thing, as, as history showed it, that NBC banned and Carson said, held a ban with him and then no, I do it on the, I do with Jimmy Fallon uh, uh, when we talk about it, except that when he was stretched between two chairs, the, the, the great musicians on the show had stretched him there and he's a tall guy. No, I didn't have anyone sit on him. Gentlemen, let me grab another chair. I grabbed a chair, climbed on the chair, climbed off the chair and stood on the middle of him. And that was the drama of the scene. So you can see how things happen unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah. Kreskin, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for taking so much time to talk with us. And I'm not going to say goodbye, but I'm going to say this, and I mean this sincerely, because I've said it all over the world. In the spirit of broadcasting, let's just say, to be continued. To be continued, indeed. What a, what a character. He's, he's just amazing. Uh, no pun intended. He, yeah. What a, what a just a absolute mensch of a guy. Yeah. He, I'm, I'm no offense to either you or me, but we're not really amazing or anybody <laughs> for that a matter. You know what I mean? Yeah. That this that a guy of his level would come on and spend as much time with us as he did because I, I'm just blown away by it. I'm touched. I. I I feel like I had, you know, I'm one step away from Johnny Carson, who's one of those people that I just idolize. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, well, we keep saying amazing. Yeah, hey, why wouldn't you? Have you seen the movie The, the Great Buck Howard uh, with John Malkovich and Colin Hanks? Oh, yes, I have actually. Yeah, that is based on, uh, admittedly, it, uh, based on the road manager of Kreskin, uh, his experiences on the road with Kreskin. And if you watch John Malkovich after having 
you know, spent, we spent about an hour with Kreskin. He absolutely captures that positive energy, that willingness to just go with what's going on. You know, Malkovich is Malkovich and has his own quirks and all, so he brings all that to it. But you really get a sense of what an interesting character Kreskin was throughout the years, travel to city to city, and just this ridiculous level of enthusiasm and positivity about what he's doing. I, I actually now want to go back and rewatch that movie. We should put that in the show notes for people who may have not tumbled to it until yeah. Yeah, you brought it up. Say the name of the movie again. It's called The Great Buck Howard, and it's uh, with John Malkovich, Colin Hanks. Tom Hanks makes a, an appearance in it, produced by Tom Hanks's company, and it doesn't give away any of the mentalism stuff, but uh, oh, but it, it, it just shows you what life was like on the road with a performer like that. And uh, his manager is played by Ricky Jay. So. Oh. No, well I guess, I guess I, I guess I forgot that in all of this. I got to go back and watch that movie. It's a, yeah. it's a good one. Yeah, good, absolutely. Good, 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 good. All right. So now that we've uh, whetted our appetite for mentalism, we should dive into the ambitious card chapter two. I'll just recap where we are so far in case anyone forgot what happened in chapter one. Uh, that's where we met Eli. We met his uncle, Harry. We traveled with Eli to the Wabasha Street Caves where he's about to appear on a live TV Halloween show. So far, he's met a British freelance journalist, Clive Albans. Uh, he's run into Pete, who's learning magic from Eli. And Pete is also the soon-to-be ex-husband of Eli's current crush, his landlord, Megan. Mm -hmm. So the lights have just gone out. The show's about to begin. Here's chapter two of... The ambitious card. I can't wait. You you have you can't you have to you shouldn't wait. You should just read it. Yeah. Why don't you pick pick up the Jim pick up, pick up the book and read. The ambitious card, an Eli Marks mystery. Chapter two. There was a yelp from the audience as the cavern suddenly went black, and then. Just as the echo of that exclamation had died down, the room began to vibrate with the deep, eerie tones of a pipe organ. A moment later, a spotlight snapped on, revealing an imposing figure all in black, standing like a statue in the center of the stage. His sudden appearance produced the intended gasp from several audience members. He stood silently for a few moments, and then the organ music dipped in volume and he began to speak in a rich, sonorous baritone. Good evening, he said. Tonight, we shall travel together across the ether. We will summon souls from the other side and explore the terrain of the afterlife, step by step and hand in hand. We will touch the past, and we will, in turn, be touched by the future. My name is Gray, and this is my promise to you. I looked at Gray on the stage across the room and then turned to get a better view on one of the widescreen TV monitors that had been placed throughout the cavern. He was tall and wiry. His thick, jet-black hair was slicked back, exposing diamond studs in each earlobe, which sparkled in the spotlight. Other reflections were produced by the oversized diamond rings he sported on the long fingers of each hand. He was dressed elegantly, in a tailored black suit coat, black turtleneck, and black slacks. His bright green eyes scanned the room methodically. To begin our journey, I require the assistance of a volunteer, he said as he launched into his act. He quickly found his first volunteer, a heavy-set woman about 45 who looked a little too well-dressed for someone planning to spend Halloween on a folding chair in a damp cave. The woman appeared both thrilled and terrified as she jumped up and made her way toward the stage, while a cameraman with a handheld video camera walked backwards in front of her. As this matronly volunteer headed down the aisle, I noticed for the first time that Gray had an assistant, a figure who was standing silently at the base of the steps. She was a slim young woman. Like Gray, she was dressed all in black, with long, dark hair that appeared to flow down to her waist and perhaps even beyond. If it wasn't for her pale, almost translucent skin, she might have disappeared completely into the black draping that spanned the back of the stage. Even from my vantage point across the room, I could see that she was both exotic and stunning. 
while others in the room had decked themselves out for Halloween, from Jedi Knights to way-too-old Harry Potters to your standard-issue ghosts, witches, and political figures, her wardrobe appeared to be something she had simply taken from her closet. Not goth, really, but just this side of Morticia Adams. Thank you, Nova, Gray said to her as she handed the woman off to him. Gray smoothly guided the volunteer up the steps and across the stage to where a heavy wooden table and three chairs had been set. "'What is your name, my dear?' he asked. "'Sharon,' she said, her voice creaking a bit from nervousness and excitement. "'Excellent. Sharon, with your help, I'm going to begin the process of moving from this, the corporeal world, to the other side. I need to ask, do you have any medical training?' I took a CPR class, she said almost apologetically, but it was years ago. Then perhaps you know how to find my pulse? Do you think you could do that? With his guidance, she proceeded to find his pulse. She held his wrist awkwardly, nodding that she had in fact found a pulse. Gray nodded and then tilted his head back with a sudden and sharp intake of breath. His body tensed and his head twisted oddly from side to side. Sharon continued to hold his wrist, her eyes widening at his near convulsions. And then she visibly paled. She moved her hand around his wrist, first slowly, then with growing concern. It's, it stopped, she finally said, a tremor of fear in her voice. You don't have a pulse. Excellent. Then I have crossed. Gray said, exhaling deeply. I now stand on the precipice of the border between the living and the deceased. For the next few minutes, I will be neither alive nor dead, but instead will act as a conduit between these two disparate worlds. He stood, and as he did, Sharon lost her grip on his wrist. Thank you for helping me to cross. He put a hand on her shoulder and guided the clearly shaken woman to the steps at the front of the stage, where his assistant helped navigate her way back to her seat. How the hell did he do that? Pete hissed in my ear. He's a couple inches shorter than I am, so this move had required him to stand on his toes. There's lots of ways to accomplish it, but my guess is he's got a tennis ball strapped into his armpit, I whispered back. A little pressure, and you cut off blood flow to the wrist, which gives the effect of no pulse. My uncle calls the trick the armpit tourniquet. Clive clucked his tongue in apparent agreement with my assessment. Our brief conversation elicited another sharp look from one of the crew members, so I didn't continue my explanation. Regardless of his method, Gray had grabbed the audience's attention, and they were listening raptly as he stepped back to his chair and withdrew a long strip of black fabric from his suit coat pocket. As I said, I have crossed and stand on the precipice between the living and the dead. However, in order to truly hone in on that connection, I need to do some fine tuning. He looked up and smiled, his oily charm emanating from every pore. For those of you who have taken long car trips, it's not unlike tuning a car radio in the middle of a remote desert, trying to find the point of greatest connection. To that end, I will attempt a couple of experiments, warm-up exercises, as it were. Experience has taught me that these are best accomplished without the burden of visual stimulation. With that, he sat down in the chair and placed the black strip of fabric over his eyes. Nova had silently joined him on stage, and she stepped forward to tie the blindfold for him, making a final adjustment to ensure that his eyes were completely covered. She then picked up a handheld microphone from the table and silently left the stage. For the next 20 minutes, Gray skillfully performed some basic, almost rudimentary mentalism routines. With the help of the dark-haired Nova, he did a second sight bit, where she selected objects from the audience members, and he, still blindfolded, divined the nature, color, and size of the objects, much to the audience's amazement. 
after several short exchanges with various audience members in which he divined the amount of money in a wallet, the age of an older gentleman, and the color of a pair of socks, Nova selected a nervous woman on the aisle. After a short, whispered exchange with the woman, Nova spoke into the handheld microphone. Her voice was soft and almost childlike. Gray? Yes, Nova, he said in a deep whisper from the stage. It sounded as if an audio engineer had added some reverberation to his microphone. See if you would tell me this woman's name, Nova said. The audience looked from Nova to Gray, who sat stiff-backed and motionless on the stage. Her name is Joy, he finally said. The woman tried to suppress her surprised reaction by putting her hand over her mouth as the audience applauded. Nova had another brief, whispered conversation with the woman, and then, as the applause died down, she continued. Now then, in what month was she born? Again, the audience turned almost in unison from Nova to Gray. She was born in... in September, he said in a flat monotone. Would you tell me the date of her birth? The 5th of September. The woman nodded vigorously to the crowd to demonstrate that every answer so far had been spot on. The audience burst into applause again. Someone's read his Corinda, Clive whispered to me out of the corner of his mouth. Classic presentation, I agreed. Nothing new here. Nova stepped back and looked the woman over head to toe. Gray, can you tell me what color shoes Joy is wearing? Gray tilted his head to one side. Her shoes are brown. The woman looked down at her feet, then shook her head, first toward Gray and then toward Nova. Nova seemed flustered for a moment. I meant, will you tell me, will you tell me what color they are? Even with a blindfold covering much of his face, Gray looked annoyed. But he quickly masked that emotion and continued, her shoes are black. The woman nodded to Nova and to the crowd, and again they applauded, but this time with what felt to me to be a little less enthusiasm. Nova held out her open palm to the woman, who at first wasn't sure what was wanted of her. Then she pulled a ring off her finger. She handed it to Nova, who clasped it tightly in her hand. Joy has given me a personal object. I want you to tell me what this is now. Gray looked momentarily puzzled. A stamp, he said, posing more of a question than making a statement. No, Nova stammered. I want you to tell me what this is, now, then. Gray did his best to cover a sigh. It's a ring. Nova quickly rattled off her next request. I'd like you to tell me what it is made of. Gold. The woman smiled and nodded to the crowd to let them know that Gray had been correct. The crowd applauded, some of their lost enthusiasm returning. Nova handed the ring to the woman and moved away, searching for another candidate. Gray, next we have a man. He cut her off brusquely. For our next exercise, we will continue to strengthen my connection with the other side. For this demonstration, my assistant will pass out several recent magazines and books. Nova looked surprised at the sudden shift in plan, but obeyed and headed back toward the stage. As she moved around the back row of seats, she passed an audio speaker resting on a stand. As soon as she moved in front of the speaker, there was a tremendous shriek of feedback. Nova held her free hand up to cover her ear. She clicked the off switch on the microphone, silencing the feedback, and then she scampered toward the stage. There, she picked up a silver tray that held a stack of magazines and books. As New Age music played through the sound system, Nova moved smoothly through the crowd, distributing the periodicals and books to anyone who held out a hand. By the time she reached me, the tray was empty. She shrugged impishly, and turned back toward the stage, putting the tray under her arm while she flipped her handheld microphone back on. Gray? 
Yes, Nova, he answered, still seated stiffly on the stage, his eyes covered by the black fabric. Distribution is complete, she said. Gray then instructed those audience members who had received a book or magazine to page through it and find a single page, and then to concentrate with all their energy on that page. As I looked around the cavern, I could see that people, God love them, were attacking the assignment with relish. Those who hadn't been lucky enough to receive one of the books or periodicals appeared to be wasting no time in assisting their neighbor in finding just the right page. The first person selected from the audience was a heavy-set man in a blue denim work shirt and suspenders. He was holding a magazine. He held the cover up to Nova and then turned the magazine toward her to reveal his chosen page number. What is your name? she asked. Scott, he said, leaning awkwardly toward the microphone. Gray, she said, turning back toward the stage. Your first reading is with Scott. Scott has this week's Time magazine, and he is looking at page 31. Time magazine, Gray repeated. Page 31. Look at that page and concentrate, Scott. Think of nothing else. He held up a hand to his forehead dramatically, then lowered it. Scott, I'm having trouble seeing page 31 because I'm seeing... An advertisement for a lady's razor, which consists primarily of a photo of a woman in a bathtub, shaving her legs. She appears to be completely naked, although I hasten to point out that the advertisement is in fine taste. However, there is no number on that page. Is that the page directly across from 31? Nova held the microphone up to Scott, who shrugged his shoulders sheepishly. Uh, yes, it is. That's an ad. Gray chuckled. <laughs> that was your first choice, wasn't it, Scott? But you didn't want to admit that to us, did you? That's right, Scott mumbled into the microphone as the audience laughed. Thank you, Scott. You may sit down. He sat amidst the good-natured teasing of several pals around him. Nova moved across the aisle to an elderly woman who was holding a paperback book. What is your name, ma'am? Nova asked. Bernice, the white-haired woman said softly. Nova looked at the book the woman was holding and the page she had the book open to. Gray, Bernice is looking at page 74 of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Gray again put his hand to his forehead for a moment, and then he spoke. Bernice, through either choice or chance... You have picked one of my favorite passages from that great play. At the top of that page, Macduff speaks, does he not? Say the words with me, Bernice. They began to read together, he on stage and she in the audience. Oh, horror, horror, horror. Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Most sacrilegious murder hath broke open the Lord's anointed temple and stole thence the life of the building. Bernice closed the book and looked up at Gray with open-mouthed awe, her eyes tearing up slightly as Gray continued to speak the verse. Approach the chamber and destroy your sight with a new gorgon. Do not bid me speak. See, and then speak yourselves. Shake off this downy sleep, death's counterfeit, and look on death itself. His final words echoed through the chamber. Bernice slowly sat back in her chair as the audience applauded enthusiastically. Even Pete and Clive on either side of me broke into spontaneous applause. I didn't join in, but I had to admit, even though Gray was as dishonest as the day is long, he was a hell of a performer. <laughs> So that was uh, chapter two of The Ambitious Card. Next time around, we'll listen to chapter three. But before we wrap up the show, I want to thank the amazing Kreskin. Uh, yes. I'll put a, a mention in the show notes about the great Doc Howard. People want to check that out. Uh, it's really worth seeing. Uh, absolutely recommend it. You know who else is in it? Emily Blunt. Yes. I've forgotten that. It's a really phenomenal cast when you think about it. 
It's it's a great little movie. It's really yeah. fun. And um, Kreskin, so much fun to talk with him. If you are as interested in him now as you've never been, you can follow Kreskin at his website, amazingkreskin.com. Uh, and then check out this episode's show notes. They'll have some links uh, of videos of Kreskin actually performing. He's got a great ambitious card routine that you should see. Yeah, I was surprised to find that ambitious card routine online because he's not known for his card work. But he's good. He's good, and it's a pretty clever routine. He sets it, it up as a, as a gambling thing, and it's definitely worth seeing. Uh, well, we should thank everybody, not just the amazing Kreskin. Uh, we appreciate you guys downloading this, listening to this, and uh, uh, being a part of this podcast. And we'll see you next time for Chapter 3 of The Ambitious Card. Man, we're flying right along. We are. And, uh, and make sure you don't miss an episode by hitting that subscribe button. And then rate us well. Give us the five stars. That's what we're hoping for. Please do. You know, Jim, after all this mentalism talk, I'm wondering, can you read my mind? I think I can, John. I think you're thinking, why don't you wrap this up, Jim, and get us out of here. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Thanks for listening. Just a friend